Um, so as I said, I, I work for the Institute of International Education. We're a not-for-profit organization uh, that administers the Fulbright program. We've had the privilege of administering the program since its inception for the past 75 years. Um, and I'm excited to share some information with you today about the program. Um, more importantly, I'm, I'm excited to introduce you all to your Fulbright program advisors. Um, these are the individuals that um, are responsible for um, promoting this program, uh, promoting this event, um, as well as working with you through the application process. Um, I do want to say not every campus has a Fulbright program advisor, um, nor an as active as uh, Fulbright program advisors as there are on this call. And so you guys are really at an advantage um, in the application process to have people that um, that care about you and care about your success and want to assist you through this process of applying for the Fulbright program. So. Um, I always love saying that on the front end, um, that these are individuals that, that care about you and want to help you through the process. And so it would behoove you to utilize them as the great resource that they are. With that, I'm going to stop sharing um, so I can bring up my list here and we're going to go through introductions so we can see who all is here um, in terms of our Fulbright program advisors. And then I'll jump back into um, the presentation and cover some nuts and bolts about the Fulbright program. Um, next on my list, all the way from Hawaii, we've got University of Hawaii at Manoa. Aloha. My name is Kristen Connors, and I am the FPA for graduate students at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And hi, I'm Andy Sutton. I'm the, uh, I oversee the Fulbright programs, and uh, last year um, stepped in and advised for undergraduate students, and I'm just in the process of pointing someone to take over that role. Um, but for now, I'm uh, joining this session. Awesome. Again, thank you all for being here. Thank you for, for doing the work, putting in the work to, to get your students here as well. Um, and thank you for volunteering to, to do the breakout meetings later on in the session. Uh, you all do great work and the Fulbright program would cease to exist and, and continue to do as well as it does without your efforts. So thank you once again. All right, everyone. Well, I'm going to jump back to our PowerPoint presentation here and, and dive into some of the nuts and bolts of the Fulbright program. Um, and also just remind you once again, if you haven't taken the time to rename yourself, please do so. Let us know which institution you're, you're coming from. Uh, represent your institution by throwing it in the, in the name. Uh, that way, my colleague Chanel, who I'd love to have her introduce herself, um, will be able to identify which campus you're coming from for the breakout meeting. So Chanel, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, all. My name is Chanel Vizmera. I work for both the Fulbright U.S. Student and Scholar Programs um, in Outreach and Recruitment. All right. So with the Fulbright Program, we always kick things off by talking about the, the mission of the program. Um, and the reason we do that is because um, just like every other prestigious award and opportunity that's out there, Fulbright has its own set of goals and, and missions and things that we're trying to accomplish through this program and through the individuals that participate in the program. So uh, the Fulbright program, uh, our mission is to foster mutual understanding between individuals in the United States and individuals abroad. And the way that we accomplish that goal are through educational activities that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Uh, but they include English teaching assistantships, they include research abroad, um, as well as opportunities to earn a master's degree or begin a master's degree abroad. Um, this program has a very rich history, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen there, uh, based off our emblem, we've been, we've been in business, we've been, uh, we've been running since uh, 1946, uh, we're celebrating our 75th year anniversary, um, and there's a lot of uh, events and activities and energy surrounding this anniversary. We're very proud of the rich history of the Fulbright program. Um, it's a very large, dynamic, um, and, and complex program, but it's a program that has accomplished a lot of, a lot of great things in its, in its long history. Um, this program is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State, the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Um, they establish the policy and are the ones that um, have ownership over the program. And as I said a couple of times, uh, myself, Chanel, and a few other IIE colleagues, um, we work on behalf of the program. We, had, we are uh, sort of on the administrative side of the program um, and have had the privilege of working with the program for uh, its entire 75-year history. 
So I said the full white program is very large, dynamic, and complex. Um, that last bullet point sort of speaks to that. Um, this is a program that exists in over 160 different countries around the world. And we're actually working in close collaboration with um, Fulbright commissions. Uh, these are entities abroad that have full-time staff that are working on behalf of the program, both sending and receiving students as well as scholars and administrators. And then in those countries where we don't have what we call the Fulbright, Fulbright Commission, we're actually working with the US embassies in those countries. So it's a, it's a very large program. I like to look at Fulbright not as one program, but as 160 different programs because we're working with all of these different countries. And every country, as you'll uh, come to, to find out as you explore the website, is that every country has different qualities, different expectations, different policies, different, uh, different traits that they're looking for in their applicants. And so one of the first things that you want to do as you are exploring this opportunity and uh, exploring the website and looking at the country summary pages is make sure that the opportunity that you're interested in applying to is a good fit for you uh, professionally, academically, um, and you uh, make sure that you're eligible for that specific country. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, so I always like to kick things off by talking about one of the cornerstones of the program, which is our focus on diversity and inclusion. Um, this is a program that does strive to represent the diversity that makes up the United States. Um, we understand that there's not one type of American and there's not one type of American experience. Um, and we see value in, in all the differences um, you know, that, that individuals have and, and all the identities that they're bringing to the table. And we want that to be showcased. Um, remember the goal of the program that we talked about, fostering mutual understanding, um, sort of being that, uh, that, that US ambassador sort of in an unofficial capacity while you're abroad. We think it's really important that the U.S. showcase its diversity and showcase, you know, the, the places that people are coming from, the backgrounds that they have. Um, and as you can see here, these opportunities are not limited in any way to people, regardless of their religion, their geographic location, socioeconomic status, race, ability level, sexual orientation, gender identity, and, and the list goes on. So know that this is uh, a hallmark of the program. Um, it has been and it will continue to be moving forward. Okay, so let's take a moment and talk a little bit about program eligibility. Um, you know, this is an exchange program between the United States and other countries. Um, and so one of the first eligibility requirements that you see on the right hand side there is that you are a US citizen by the application deadline. The second eligibility trait that you see here is that you must have a bachelor's degree or equivalent by the start of the grant. Um, so having that BA before you're actually in that host country that you're applying to. And then the third point here is that you don't have a doctorate degree at the time of application. So the way that I like to look at this is that, you know, there's a lot of life that can elapse between getting your bachelor's degree and obtaining a PhD if that's something that you're you know, wanting to pursue. So a lot of life, a lot of years can elapse between those two points. And any time between those two life events, you are eligible to apply for the Fulbright US Student Program. Now we have other programs that are out there for those that have a PhD or those that may have you know, years and years of experience in a given trade and they would be more of an expert or professional in that, in that area. Um, but for the sake of today's presentation, we're going to be talking about the Fulbright U.S. Student Program. I always like to point out that with this program, there is no age limit um, and that you are eligible to apply even if you are not currently enrolled in an institute of higher ed or you're a few years out of school. Um, I mean, I've talked to Fulbrighters that were, you know, in their 60s uh, that were able to apply for this program, design a project and successfully um, conduct that project abroad. Um, so you're not limited by age, um, but do keep in mind that we are, you do have to have that bachelor's degree or equivalent, um, and you can't have a PhD at the time of application. Now, something I didn't point out at the beginning that I, I wanted to make sure to mention was that we have, uh, we have worked with your FPAs and have made everyone a, uh, a co-host 
Um, therefore, what we'd like you to do if you have questions that come up throughout the, the presentation here is to send a direct message to your FPA or one of your FPAs and, and ask them that question. And they can either get back with you, um, you know, via typing back to you instantly, or they may take that question um, and try to answer it for the, for the benefit of everyone else during the breakout meeting. Um, so if you do have those questions, um, you know, for now, please refrain from sending it to everyone. That way we don't clog up the, the chat option there um, and send those messages directly to your Fulbright program advisors, which you should be able to do um, because they're listed as co-host. And so you can see their name, the institution, and that they are your FPA. So out, away from that quick commercial um, and talk about the last point here. I, I sort of mentioned this before, but every country, um, all 140 or so different countries um, in the Fulbright student program are going to have country specific requirements. And so it's gonna be really wise of you to take the necessary time to navigate to our website and look at those country summaries pages to make sure that what you're planning on applying for is a good fit for what you're looking at doing and that you're eligible to apply to that particular country. Um, I mean, just to address the, the points on the, right, on the left hand side there, this is an opportunity that's open to graduating seniors, recent graduates, graduate students. Um, you know, as I said, as long as you fall into the, you know, have a bachelor's degree or equivalent by the start of the grant and don't have the PhD, you are welcome to apply for the Fulbright US Student Program. And I'm excited that this program focuses a lot of attention on those that are in the creative from performing arts. And so if you're a dancer, if you're a set designer, um, if you play the bassoon, um, there are opportunities that exist within the Fulbright U.S. Student Program for you to take that skill that you already have in that art form and take it to the next level um, and, and learn from professionals there on the international stage or really kind of put your, pra put your, your craft into practice um, internationally. Okay. So big picture. Um, each year, we have about 2,200 awards um, for individuals to go to over 140 different countries. And we break these two different types of awards into two different buckets, if you will, two different categories. Um, the first bucket are what we call study research grants. And these are where you are pursuing independent research. Uh, perhaps you're pursuing independent study, or you're doing a project in the uh, creative and performing arts. We like to, to refer to these opportunities as a build your own adventure, right? Where you are telling us exactly where it is in the country you wanna go, what it is precisely you're going to be doing, um, why you wanna be there and why you are the ideal candidate to go to that country to do that project. Um, so we have about 950 of these awards. Um, you can see there that you're in country for an academic year. And uh, we have about 140 different countries that are participating in, in this sort of bucket of, of opportunities. Um, so I, I think this is, it's, it's hard to conceptualize if you're not familiar with the program. And so I'm just gonna throw out a couple examples of what some Fulbrighters have done in the past. Um, I like this example of Gwen, Gwyneth, uh, Gwyneth Talley. Uh, Gwyneth is from Nebraska and she has a background in anthropology as well as education. And she was a Fulbright researcher. And what she did um, on her project to Morocco was while she was there, she volunteered at an equestrian charity hospital. And she was there both improving her skill in Arabic, as well as acting as a sort of a translator for, vo for, uh, for foreign uh, veteran students, veterinarian students, helping them communicate with local um, horse owners, mule owners, as well as like donkey owners. Um, so that's what her project was. And then on top of that, her research focused on sort of the human animal relationship, specifically with women that were horseback riders in a traditional equestrian sport. So that's what she spent her time that eight to 10 months in country doing was studying these women as well as working um, sort of on a volunteer basis at that charity hospital to improve her Arabic skills. So since then, since Fulbright, she's earned a PhD. Um, she's returned to Morocco uh, on several occasions as a National Geographic student expedition leader and expert. And I know now that she's working on a film and also working on a book that's based on those experiences that she had as a Fulbrighter. 
Um, so that's just one example of, of what one can do um, in that independent research category. As I said before, um, you're able to pursue a master's degree through the Fulbright program and have that funded. So you are choosing the university that you want to go to abroad. You're choosing the program that you want to apply to. You are applying to that institution while at the same time filling out your Fulbright application. And if you are accepted into that institution and uh, your application continues to move forward in the Fulbright process, you could get a grant to earn a master's degree abroad. Um, there are a lot of countries out there that have one-year master's programs or two-year master's programs even that can be funded by the Fulbright program. Um, so an example that I like to use um, is of Emmanuel Johnson. Emmanuel um, hails from North Carolina A&T, where he was the first Fulbrighter um, to, to earn a grant. And he went to the UK where he earned a master's degree in robotics from the University of Birmingham. And so while he was there, he also volunteered at a local middle school to help students um, that were struggling in math and in the sciences. And then on top of that, he volunteered with the program to help young black men um, gain skills and prepare for job interviews. Um, so as I said before, the Fulbright program is all about fostering mutual understanding, right? It's about you being that cultural ambassador while in the host country. And so we wanna know what you're doing, not only on your project, but what you're doing to connect with the community of the host country. And I think Emmanuel's example is a great one of taking a skill that he already had in the STEM fields and, and then paying it forward and, and working with students in secondary schools, as well as working with, with young men on their job interview skills. Um, today, uh, Emmanuel is pursuing a PhD in computer science research, where he's uh, focusing his attention on improving negotiation training using artificial intelligence uh, to provide personalized feedback. That's way over my head, um, but the education that he was able to receive as a Fulbrighter in the UK really acted as a stepping stone for him to be able to get into the PhD program and, and pursue ultimately what he was passionate about in AI. So hopefully those examples give you guys an idea of, of what's possible in that sort of that first bucket of opportunities called research study grants. The, the second bucket um, are what we call these English teaching assistantships, ETAs for short. We're gonna be throwing that name ETA around pretty frequently and so that's what it means, um, English teaching assistantship. And these are opportunities where you are working with non-native English speakers in a classroom setting. This could be K through 12 or it may be um, in higher education. It may be working at a university um, or a college environment. And you're helping non-native English speakers learn the language, as well as helping students learn more about US culture from your perspective. Uh, remember what I said earlier about, you know, they're not being one type of American or one type of American experience. Um, these English teaching experiences really give you an opportunity to take your slice of America and bring it into the classroom setting um, and really help students not only learn more um, about the English language, but even learn more about the U.S. culture from your perspective. So a couple examples. Uh, Clarissa Davis, uh, she attended Spelman and decided to apply for Fulbright to do an ETA in Malaysia. While she was there, she was teaching at a secondary school. And then outside of the time that she was spending in the classroom with students, um, she shared her passion with her students through art projects that she worked on, I know that she spoke on uh, many panel discussions about the United States and shared her perspective. And then she was able to create ties and connections with students through food, music, and, and film as well. Um, so that's what she did as a Fulbrighter, as an English teaching assistant, as an English teaching assistant. Um, and then she also worked with the state government to revise their English language curriculum while she was there. So today, since Fulbright, uh, uh, since Fulbright, Clarissa has been able to earn a, an MBA, and she was uh, she is now a strategy and research consultant at a global management consulting firm. So, I I give you that example to let you know that we're not necessarily looking for the next wave of English teachers um, with this program. If that's something that you desire to become later on, that's that's perfectly fine. But we've we've had 
individuals that are coming from the medical field, you know, wanting to pursue medical degrees. We've had folks that have come from the, the theatrical uh, and performing arts be English teaching assistants, and also individuals that have come from the STEM fields. As long as you have a sincere desire to be that cultural ambassador in the classroom setting, then this is a program that could be a good match for you. Um, as you can see here, you're also going to be in country for an academic year. Uh, we have about 1,200, over 1,200 of these opportunities available. And there are about 75 countries that offer English teaching assistance. Um, so again, when you're on the website, be sure to um, comb through the, the site and, and find countries that offer this opportunity if this is something that you're interested in. Um, one more example of an ETA, David Morales, uh, he's from California, and his involvement in educational activism as well as international solidarity movements led him to serve as an English teaching assistant in Ecuador. So while he was in Ecuador, he led courses as well as seminars at uh, a local university for undergraduate students. And his courses focused on US history as well as culture. And today, uh, David uh, is a PhD candidate at Stanford University in the race, uh, inequality and language uh, department or, or program that's, that's in the education program at Stanford. And he's also a, an instructor uh, there at the university as well. So that's an example of somebody that did want to pursue education long-term and was able to utilize the Fulbright program as a stepping stone to that career. So those are just a couple examples of, of what's possible through the Fulbright program. All right, continuing to move forward, I've talked to you now for 20 minutes or so, and you guys don't even know what you get. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the award benefits. Um, so starting with pre-grant and in-country, um, we consider Fulbright a, a fully funded opportunity. Um, and the way that we define that is we offer round trip airfare uh, for all of our grantees, as well as a monthly stipend. Um, this stipend is going to be dependent upon the cost of living in that host country. Um, and it's typically like a graduate level of living in that host country. So you're not gonna to return to the United States independently wealthy. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the goal of the program, uh, but it is enough money to be able to take care of your lodging, take care of incidentals, and be able to travel around the country and get familiar with the regional differences. Um, so you get that round trip airfare, you get the monthly stipend. You also, what's also included um, is accident and sickness benefits. Um, if you were to get sick while abroad. And then you see there a whole list of, of other possible benefits that include, but not limited to support for dependents in some cases. Again, be sure to check out the country summaries page for those details. Um, there may be uh, money set aside for research allowance um, or tuition or language lessons. Um, and then these enhancement activities are a really cool opportunity um, as you're in country to connect with other Fulbrighters. Um, so one of the benefits of becoming a Fulbrighter that's not stated here is you really become part of this elite, um, but not elitist network of scholars worldwide. And, and you never know where those connections, those friendships, those relationships, those collaborations that you have with others are going to, um, where they're going to lead you and how they're going to not just benefit you, but allow you to benefit others uh, down the road. And then the last point there are for those that have um, disability that, that need disability related accommodations. Um, as I said before, um, cornerstone of this program is, is access, is diversity, is inclusion. And so we want to make sure that everyone has the resources that they need in order to be successful while abroad. So if you do have a disability, uh, visible or invisible, please be sure to touch base with your Fulbright program advisor, as well as re reach out to us so we can provide you with resources and make sure you have the resources that you need to be successful all abroad. Wow, I'm parched. Is anybody else parched? Okay. Just making sure it's not just me. All right, so some of the post-grant benefits here. Um, first is that you become part of this network of scholars worldwide. I, I kind of touched on that before. Um, you also have access to uh, the State Department's uh, website where they have resources um, that are great. You get a lifetime Fulbright email. Um, 
Fulbright Association is an independent organization um, that is worldwide. And so this is a great way that you can stay connected um, with the Fulbright program um, even after you're done. And then um, this 12 month eligibility non-competitive non-competitive eligibility status, hiring status uh, within the federal government. This is a great advantage for those that are interested in pursuing a career, maybe at the State Department or one of the other branches of the federal government. Uh, this is a great way to get your foot in the door um, and, and you know, kind of put yourself ahead of other people when it, comes to, when it comes to hiring. So another amazing benefit of becoming a Fulbrighter. Now I'm gonna pause just for a second um, and Chanel, can I, can I have you make another announcement about renaming just to make sure that everybody is, is on the same page? Yes, actually we're doing uh, really well. Um, but yes, if you haven't, please put your institution name in your name. That would be very much appreciated as we're getting close to breakout rooms. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. All right. So moving ahead, I wanna take a little bit of time and talk about the application components. Uh, but before I do, I forgot to mention, like our application opens tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, the, the website that you see now is, isn't gonna look completely different, but it will have updated information for the 22-23 application cycle. So we all at IIE have been working really hard with our partners across the world to make sure to get up, the, you know, those, those country summaries up to date. And, and have great resources in place for you on the website. So um, you're not going to be able to see updated information today, um, but check back with us tomorrow morning at I believe around 10 a.m. Eastern time is, is when we're going to officially launch. So you guys can be some of the first people to check out the, the new awards for this, this upcoming cycle. All right, so the application itself. Um, I won't spend a ton of time here because you guys have great help on your campus through your FPAs to walk you through each of these processes and each of these um, application components. But I do wanna highlight a few things. Um, the first are these, um, are these short answer questions. So the, the basic personal data as well as the program information. What you're going to find is that um, there are three initial questions that we're asking. These are short answer questions. Um, the first is an abstract, the second is host country engagement, and the third is future plans. So with the abstract, um, this is one of the first pieces of information that the reviewers are going to be able to see um, to get to know you. And so this should be something that um, draws the reader in and makes them eager and anxious and, and excited rather about reviewing the rest of your application. And so the abstract is basically the who, what, where, when, how, and why of your application. Where are you going? What are you doing? Um, and, and how are you framing this in an interesting way to, to grab people's attention? What this isn't is, what this isn't is, I don't know how to say that, but what this isn't is, this isn't you grabbing or copying uh, bits of your application and posting them directly into this abstract section. This should be something that's very well thought out um, and uh, provides a good synopsis of what it is that you're proposing to do in the host country. And it is required, all of these short answer questions are required for those that are applying for the English teaching assistantship or the study research awards. I don't know that I pointed this out before, but um, one of those first decisions that you need to make as you're going through this process is what type of award you want to apply for, as you're not allowed to apply for both types of awards. You're only allowed to submit one application per application cycle. So you're either choosing the English teaching assistantship or you are choosing one of the study research awards. So that could be an independent research project. It may be um, taking, uh, you know, earning a master's degree abroad. It could be a hybrid between those two where you are auditing courses at a university as a non-degree seeking student and working on your research or sort of that last path. It could be uh, focus on the creative and performing arts. So the host country engagement is that second uh, short answer question that we ask you. Uh, and this is where you can really talk more about what your plans look like for being that unofficial cultural ambassador um, in your community. Uh, we wanna know what you're doing to get outside of uh, your apartment or outside of your dormitory or wherever you're staying 
uh, to engage and, and get to know the people in your community. Um, so we want you to talk about those plans in this short essay. And then the next short answer question um, has to do with your future plans. We want to know how you as a person connect with what it is that you're proposing to do in that host country, your project, um, and then how that fits into your future plans. So we're looking at the person, we're looking at um, the, the project that, you, that you're doing, and we're also looking at the potential that this has uh, for future plans. We want to see trajectory within the Fulbright program. We want to make sure that what it is that you're proposing to do is connected with what's coming next be that graduate school or uh, pursuing a, a professional career. Now, I, I know not everybody has their, their whole life planned out for the next five, 10 years. Um, I, I don't even have that planned out, but we do want you to have um, you know, some idea of what direction you're going. And we wanna know how Fulbright fits into those plans. Does that make sense? I, I can't hear you, but <laughs> I'm just gonna assume that makes sense. Okay, so the heart of your application is, is going to be this next section, and that's going to be your essays, both the statement of grant purpose as well as the personal statement. Uh, the statement of grant purpose, as you can see here, it's not very long, right? For those that are doing a research study award, it's a maximum of two pages. Uh, now, with a raise of hands, who has written a paper longer than two pages in the last, I don't know, week, right? Two weeks. That's that's most of you guys, right? So the length isn't the challenge here. That, that's, that's really not the challenge at all. The challenge is you taking all of your ideas and crafting a proposal that's gonna be very clear, concise, and compelling, where you're really sort of driving home the, you know, the, the purpose of the, of the grant. You're talking about why it is you're the ideal candidate to go to that country to do that project. You're talking about the support that you have there in country um, that allow this project to be feasible, right? You're, you're going into all of those details and with the study research grant, you're doing it in less than two pages. So that's, that's really the challenge there. And that's where working with the Fulbright Program Advisor um, really comes in handy as they've been working with students uh, for numbers of years and, and they have a, a better sense of how to take all of these great ideas that you have and whittle it down to a very clear and, and concise statement of grant purpose. So the, the same is true with this English teaching assistantship. Only difference is you only have one page uh, to get all of these ideas out of how you're going to be that effective communicator in the classroom, how you're going to help students um, learn, the, learn the English language as well as learn more about US culture, what methodologies that you're, you're planning on you know, bringing into the classroom setting. Maybe you want to use activities um, as a way to teach students through puzzles or games or um, other, other interactive activities. You know, this is where you're talking about um, those details in that statement of grant purpose. Now the personal statement, this is something that's required for both those that are applying for the study research grant, as well as those that are applying for the English teaching assistantship. And the difference between this grant and the statement of grant purpose is that this is more of, a, of an intellectual biography that's in narrative form. This is where you really get to share a little bit more of your story and where the reviewers get this 360 perspective of, of who you are as an individual. Um, so the style is going to be up to you, um, but the content should convey sort of what's brought you to this point in your life and what it is that you're looking at, at doing next and how Fulbright sort of fits into these, fits into these plans that you have. So the essays are the heart of the application. Um, I do wanna say having sat in many uh, review meetings that one of the, the sort of tricks that the uh, reviewers have to remind themselves about an individual candidate because they're reading several applications um, is they go back to the abstract and, and they look at what's stated there where you're talking about the who, what, where, when, how, why, and you're, you're hopefully drawing them in. So it's really important that you do spend some time um, not leaving this for the last bit, but spend some time thinking about this abstract and how you can write it in a way that draws, draws the, leader in, the reader in um, and, and instantly grabs their attention. Okay, let's talk a little bit about reports and references. The first point here is these foreign language evaluations. 
Um, I'll start by saying there are some countries that require that you have a certain level of language skills. Um, we always use the example of Spanish uh, because it's widely spoken here in the United States and widely taught. The expectation is if you're going to a Spanish speaking country that you have at least an intermediate to advanced level of Spanish skill. Um, you would be hard pressed to find a country, Spanish speaking country that doesn't require that. So that, that's one example of where that level of skill is going to be required. And what you're going to have to do is uh, present a language evaluation that's sort of personalized. And so it's an evaluation of your own skills and then have a professional language teacher evaluate your skills and provide feedback. Um, so it's, it's kind of a two-step process, um, a self-evaluation and then a professional language evaluation. But there are many, many countries out there and there are many Fulbrighters that don't have uh, foreign language experience um, to where they're able to apply for the Fulbright program and be very successful. And so as you go through the country summaries pages, be sure to take note of, of whether or not the country uh, does require that you have language skills or does it recommend that you have language skills or it may not be required at all. Um, Bahasa, Indonesia, uh, Indonesian languages aren't widely spoken or taught here in the United States. Um, so that's one language where it's not going to be required in the host country. But remember the goal of the program, again, I'm gonna keep bringing it back to fostering mutual understanding, being this effective communicator and citizen ambassador abroad. Language is a big part of that. And being able to communicate at least on a hospitality level is, is going to be important. So what we'd love to see is that you at least have a hospitality level of language skill and you can talk about how you are formally or informally learning the language. Um, and that shows the readers that you're committed to that, that country and that place um, and getting to know the people. Um, and you can, there's, place, there's spots in the application where you can talk about what you're looking at doing to gain at least that hospitality, hospitality level of language skill you know, from the time that you apply to the time that you would be going abroad because you know, a good year and a, and a half will elapse between those two events. Letters of reference. Um, so these should not only come from individuals that know you well and can speak to you know, how great of an individual you are and, and, and the personal qualities that you bring to the table, but these should be from individuals that can speak, um, speak deeply and speak eloquently, if you will, about why you are the ideal person to go to the country that you're looking at going to and can speak about the skills um, that relate to the project that you're proposing to do. So these go beyond, you know, you were just an intern in this office for, for a semester or something like that. And, you know, they're, they're saying that you're, you're, a great, you're a great person. Um, these are speaking specific, about specific skills that relate to the project that you're doing abroad. Um, so definitely take some time, work with your Fulbright program advisors to think about who in your life uh, would be the ideal person to, to act as this, this referee for you. The campus committee evaluation. Um, I'm not going to say a lot here because the full white program advisors on this call will walk through what the processes look like on your particular campus. What I do want to say is that this campus committee process is meant to, meant to help you. It's not meant to be an extra hurdle and trip you up. Uh, it, it is really meant to make sure that all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted and you feel extremely confident about what it is that you're proposing to do in the host country and your application as a whole by the time the national deadline hits. So this is meant to, this is meant to benefit you and to help you. And again, not all, not all campuses have FPAs. Not every individual applying for the program has this, this level of mentorship and assistance. And so definitely utilize it to, to, the, to the max. Transcripts, we're looking for a complete academic record. So if you've studied abroad and those marks aren't, um, or those, those grades um, aren't uh, translated on your current transcript, uh, then you'll need to make sure to get in touch with that institution. Same is true with, with community colleges or, or any, other, um, any other academic marks that you have from, from any other institutions. Just make sure you're presenting a complete academic record. And then the last point here has to do with those that are looking to pursue a study or research award or doing a project in the creative and performing arts. So for those that fall into that category, 
we are looking for you to present basically what, what is equivalent to like a letter of invitation from the university that it, you're looking at going to. And this could be a letter of acceptance into that university. Um, we're looking for sort of a base camp in that host country. Uh, if you're doing a, a research project and you're working in a laboratory, this may be a letter that comes from that lab tech um, or the, the, the department head of that laboratory. Um, not only saying that they're excited that you're going to be working with them, but they're talking about how uh, you're going to be able to bring uh, this, the skills that you're going to be able to bring to that project and um, talk about how feasible this project is. If you are somebody that's doing archival research, maybe this letter of affiliation is coming from uh, the person, the, the director of that museum, um, and they're talking about how they're going to grant you access to a workstation, uh, give you access to those archives. Um, so the example that I like to use for letters of affiliation are uh, one of our Fulbright alumni ambassadors, her name is Misha Granado, and Misha went to Barbados to do a project that focused on women that were diagnosed with breast cancer um, and trying to learn more about why these women that had this diagnosis were timid um, or not real thrilled about going and getting medical attention or medical support. So that was, that was the question she was trying to address. Now, as an American that, that didn't have really strong ties to Barbados, she couldn't just expect to hop on a plane, go over to Barbados, find these women, and expect these women to just open up to her and, and share their life stories. That's not feasible. It's not realistic. Um, it, it just wouldn't happen, right? So what she chose to do, who she chose to reach out to, better said, um, is the Minister of Health there in Barbados. So she sent this individual letter, talked about what it was that she was proposing to do, and asked that she have support. That individual got back with her um, over time eventually. Uh, they worked together to really sort of craft this, this letter. Um, and basically this individual gave her credibility as a researcher. Um, she gave her access to this population of women um, and allowed her to really kind of just get access into spaces and places and people that she wouldn't have otherwise. And so it really bolstered the feasibility of her being able to do the project that she was proposing to do. So that's what we're looking for in a letter of affiliation is we're looking for that, that point of contact abroad. They don't need to provide funding. Fulbright is doing that. They are providing expertise, resources, um, and, and support that will allow you to be successful. Uh, for those that are in the creative and performing arts, what we're looking for is a portfolio of your skills. Um, and this is going to be one of the first things that the reviewers are evaluating. So for musicians, it's going to be um, tracks of your music. For dancers, it's going to be recordings of you dancing. And the list goes on. There are very specific details um, based off the field of study on the website uh, for those that are in the creative and performing arts. I'm kind of running low on time here, so let me whiz ahead and talk a little bit about the factors in selection as well as the timeline. Okay, so I feel like I've been talking about these factors in selection as we've been going through this presentation. I've talked about feasibility. Um, I, I've talked about how you need to match your academic background and professional record with what it is that you're proposing to do in that host country. Some of the personal qualities that we're looking for in Fulbrighters is maturity, right? You're doing an independent research study um, or English teaching assistantship um, abroad. Um, you're not going as a, as a group. And so we're looking for individuals that are mature, people that are flexible and adaptable to new environments and situations, individuals that have strong communication skills um, and relevant experience. So we're looking for, for all of those things. Um, in Fulbrighters. Um, I like to say that we're looking for within the application, we're looking for the, the, the three I's. We're looking for projects that are innovative. We're looking for projects that are inclusive, um, keeping in mind the, the mission in, of the Fulbright program and projects that are impactful. What is the impact for you? What is the impact for the individuals in the community that you're working with? And what is the impact that you're gonna bring back here to the United States once the award is, is, is done and over with? We're also looking at language preparation. We talked a bit about that. Um, factors established by the FFFS, FFSB, the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. Um, these are the ones that established the policy for the program. All of these are spelled out um, on the website. 
Um, and then the extent to which you can help us reach our goals in terms of uh, achieving diversity, and this is in its broadest sense, um, as well as advancing the goals of the Fulbright program. And then just a reminder, once again, every country is different. And so be sure to pay attention to the country summaries page to get those in-depth details about how Morocco is different than Ecuador and, and what you need to do in order to be um, eligible for that, that specific country. All right. I think this is my last slide here. So looking at the timeline, um, right now you are thinking about where it is you want to go, what it is you're doing. You're working with your Fulbright program advisor to design this project, prepare your application. And then our application opens tomorrow. Uh, so you are going to hit the ground running and, and hopefully spend a lot of time on the website and with your Fulbright program advisor uh, crafting this, this awesome proposal that you will then submit to us uh, by the deadline of October 12th. And this is at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and we will not accept any applications after that time. So it's really important that you are submitting your application before that deadline. What happens next is a, a two-step review process. The first step is your application is reviewed here in the United States um, by faculty from across the nation. They are reviewing like uh, like app applications. So they are reviewing applications of individuals that are going to the same country that you are and applying for the same type of award that you're applying for. It's an it's apples to apples comparison. From there, they're selecting semifinalists. Um, if you are selected as a semifinalist, your application is being sent on to the host country for a second wave of review uh, there in that country. If you are not selected as a semifinalist, then we're going to notify, we'll, we'll notify everyone in December, January time period, whether or not you were recommended as a semifinalist. If you're not recommended, we highly recommend that you apply again. Uh, we love the saying, if at first you don't succeed, I can't hear you. Don't, don't, don't unmute yourself. Just try again. Try, try again. That, that's how the saying goes. Um, we've had a lot of Fulbrighters that, that didn't get it their first time around or even their second time around, but they stuck with it. Um, they were able to tweak their application and come back even stronger the subsequent year. So if at first you don't succeed, definitely try again. And then as you can see, final decisions are going to be made on a rolling basis the subsequent fall. So what's happening right now for those that applied last year is, is we are um, going through the final notification process. And that same thing will happen next year. So that's a little bit about the program. Um, I think I went over just by a couple of minutes here, um, but I do want to thank you for your time. Um, I, I do want to point out a few of our resources here. You're gonna see that we're gonna be rolling out with a webinar series very soon. Uh, you will see a lot of those dates on our go live on our website tomorrow. Um, we do about 40 of those webinars throughout the application cycle um, that, care, that cover a wide variety of topics. Um, if you have questions, we get paid to help you guys um, through the application process. And so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you guys also have great resource there in your Fulbright program advisors. And what's going to happen next, um, if everybody is sorted into their breakout rooms, is we are going to allow you to spend a little bit of time with your FPAs, getting to know who they are, um, how you can get in touch with them, as well as learn more about the university process on your particular campus, as every campus is a little different. Um, so you guys can see the resources here. Definitely follow us on all the social media sites. And uh, I guess I can leave you with this. You know, Imagine that you have an opportunity to, to go to a country of your choice pursue a project that you're passionate about, all the while being this cultural ambassador uh, while you're abroad in that community. Um, that essentially is the Fulbright US Student Program. And I hope you take some time to, to look into the program more deeply. So thank you all. And from here, I'm gonna hand it over to Chanel to send you guys to your breakout rooms. Um, so um, if you apply through the institution, institution, the committee will give you feedback on your application and we interview you so that we can add additional notes about you as an applicant and your application and submit that to IIE who will share that with the National Screening Review Committee. Okay, so that's, that's a key advantage to applying to the institution versus applying at large. If you apply at large, you don't get that additional support and feedback. It will still be considered, um, but you know, 
you won't get that little expertise on, on how to tweak your application and other information you might want to include to bolster your, your, applicant, your application. The interviews will normally happen around mid to late September, um, which will then give you about a couple of weeks to refine your application before submitting it on that October 12th deadline. Again, that is also a very hard and fast deadline. Um, they will close down the online application system <laughs> at 5 p.m. Eastern time on the 12th. So don't wait until the 12th to submit your application. Always plan a couple days ahead to submit to make sure it actually goes through and that it gets in because everyone's gonna try to submit at the same time. And the last thing you want is to be trying to click over and over again in the 11th hour and then your application doesn't go through after all the hard work that you've put in. Once the application deadline closes, uh, it will go on to the National Screening Committee. The reviewers will rate your applications and then the selected you know, group will move on to the next round. You will be notified normally by January um, whether you are a semifinalist. Um, so semifinalist just means that your application has been moved on for host country review. So the commission or the embassy in your host country um, will take another look at your application um, and then they'll make the final decision as to whether or not they're going to be accepting your application. And then they'll notify IIE of the final selection. There is the occasion where if you're not selected as a finalist, you might be notified that you are waitlisted. And so what that means is if, and, you know, if additional funding becomes available or if a spot becomes available, because just because you're selected as a finalist does not mean that that, that person is going to accept the award. They might be applying to other you know, fellowships and grants as well and might accept something else. So if a spot becomes available for you, reach out to you and let you know that you're now moving on to the finalist stage. And then depending on the period for your country, IIE will work with you to prepare for um, your orientation, uh, which can happen just a couple weeks to a month before or a couple months before you're supposed to go on your fellowship and then work with you for your time frame to go on your actual um, Fulbright. I know someone's asking if you're graduating in fall 2021, are you eligible? Uh, yes, as long as you are not graduating with a PhD. So again, very, very clear. You cannot have a PhD and be eligible to apply. You can still be a PhD student, but you cannot have earned the PhD degree and then apply. Um, and then how many applications are selected and forwarded on for the final round? It really depends. The country will normally give IIE a number of what they're looking for, you know, to, to go on, or they'll say this is the minimum score that you have to obtain to be considered as a semifinalist for the country. So it'll vary by award and country. Okay. Let um, me just um, add here that um, countries have uh, vastly different numbers of um, awardees that they're looking for in certain categories. So if you're interested in English teaching assistantship, there are some countries that are looking for four or five, and there are other countries that are looking for 150 um, mm -hmm. uh, whereabouts. Yeah. <laughs> and so obviously you've got a better chance um, if you're not, if you just, you only wanna to go to teach English in this one country, well, then you just apply and hope that you get it. But if you're flexible, like you have a region of the world you're interested in, and not a particular country. And it was actually mentioned that uh, Indonesia didn't require private, uh, previous language ability. Uh, I know that that country has a large uh, number of ETAs or English teaching assistants that they're looking for. Whereas I think Norway is something like four or five. Um, and I'm not sure whether they require beginning Norwegian or not, but all this information is available on the, on the website. You know, you can go country by country and see how many they're looking for. So um, the resources mm -hmm. available through the Fulbright website are really extraordinary, uh, really can help mm -hmm. you, um, you know, create a, 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 a viable project. So, and make some Thank good choices. You. Okay. Okay, so next I wanted to share some resources with you. Um, 
if you're interested in a copy of this presentation, um, you can email me. My email will be at the end and I'll, I'll drop it in the um, chat box as well. And I, I can email you a copy of this so you have the website link. Um, but as an institution, we have a Fulbright webpage that you'll want to visit because it'll remind you of the campus deadline along with the national deadline and who the Fulbright program advisors are for undergrad versus graduate students. So you know who to get in touch with um, to start working on your application. Whether you're a graduate student or not, I would encourage you to check out our graduate division webpage and competition calendar. I have an interest form right here to sign up here to receive up-to-date information, news, advice about FUSP. Um, so I will put you on a special email list. And every time I hear an update about Fulbright, um, or I know that there's like a really good webinar that IAE is hosting that's coming up, I'll go ahead and I'll send you, um, you know, information about that. Or I'll send reminders like at this point in time, if you haven't met with your advisor and reviewed your proposal statement, you should start that process. Um, so I'll give you kind of, um, you know, advice as you're moving through the application process. So go ahead and sign up there. And then there's also the timeline that's available that just kind of steps through. Here are the times that you should be working on which parts of your application. So you can just kind of scroll through that. And then for the campus interview, um, just wanted to share again, that's mid to late September. So they will be conducted virtually again. Um, well, at least, at least on my side for graduate students. Um, and it'll, again, just be the committee asking you questions to understand you better as an applicant and then giving you feedback on your application as well. Okay. And then again, please, please, tomorrow when the competition opens, visit the Fulbright website. I would recommend that if you already know what country you're interested in applying, check out the country specific details. The awards, the amount of awards, the requirements will all differ by country, whether there's a language requirement, uh, whether there's a dual citizenship restriction, a grant period. Um, maybe you want to do research and you're planning to be there for a year, but Fulbright can only fund you for a nine month period. That's important to know um, as you're planning out your proposal. So make sure to check that out tomorrow. I do want to just go over the different application components and just kind of go over some little tips and, and point out the, the key parts again to the application. So for the short answer portion with the abstract host country engagement and future plans, as Lee mentioned, the abstract is key. Um, the reviewers will consistently go back and look at what you've written in your abstract. As they discuss your application in the screening committee and as they're looking at your application, they don't have time to always review back to the nitty gritty that you included throughout your essay. They're gonna read your entire application, but then when they wanna just get a quick reminder of, okay, what were they saying? What are they proposing again? What is the focus? You know, who's their affiliation? They're gonna go back to your abstract. So make sure that your abstract is distinct. And then just remember the mission and goal of the Fulbright US Student Program is to increase mutual understanding between nations. So you are going as an ambassador, whether you're gonna be an ETA or you're doing research or you're gonna do a graduate degree abroad, that's the means that's getting you to the host country, but you're there as an ambassador. So you have to remember that throughout your application that that needs to um, be communicated, that that's something that's present um, and that you're being mindful of as you're putting all parts of your application together, okay? And because you're serving as ambassador, it's not just about what you can share abroad about your American experience and about the U.S., but what is it that you're going to gain from that host country and bring back? And how does that also then relate back to your future plan? Okay, so keep those things in mind. For the essays, be very mindful of the formatting guidelines. 
Okay, um, those are, are very strict guidelines, whether it's the margins, the font that you're supposed to use, page numbers. So prepare for your essays. I recommend that you start by just kind of outlining the points that you're going to make and the attributes about yourself as an applicant that you want to include. Very key, avoid jargon. The reviewers are not familiar with your discipline necessarily. So they're going to be more familiar with the country or region that you're applying to. So if you're physics, um, you might have someone in microbiology who is reading your proposal. They need to understand what you're trying to say. Okay, so really make sure you're avoiding jargon um, specific to your discipline when you're writing. And make sure to, again, communicate throughout your essays, not just through the rest of your application, but communicate, how are you prepared for what you're proposing? How are you prepared to teach English abroad? How are you prepared to be an ambassador? How are you prepared and qualified to conduct the research that you're proposing? Because as Lee mentioned, one of the, the key factors they're looking at is feasibility. Is what you're proposing feasible? Are you, as an applicant, qualified to execute what you are proposing, whether it's the host country engagement, research, the teaching component. Okay, so those are all things that they're looking at. For the research statement of grant purpose, again, be very clear and concise. You need to really make sure that you're, you're giving a good summary of how you're addressing the research question you're investigating, right? Make sure you include a timeline. I know you only have two pages, but I so often see in the, in the first draft that students forget to communicate the timeline. And that's a key factor of feasibility so that they know that you have a plan um, for how to execute what you're proposing when you go abroad, okay? And again, feasibility, feasibility, feasibility. Make sure that that is clearly communicated. In your personal statement, um, again, share who you are. What's unique about your American experience? They are trying to put together a diverse, you know, class of ambassadors <laughs> to represent the U.S. So how do you represent the American experience? Not what is it that you think is the American experience? What is your personal experience? You want to be very authentic in your application about communicating who you are and your passion for what you're proposing and the passion for going to the country that you're proposing. One of the things that students will ask me, they'll say, oh, I see on the statistics that this, this country, you know, it looks like there's, you know, 160 ETA spots available and there's no foreign language requirement. And it looks like they have a 50% award rate. Should I apply there? Well, my first question is, well, why are you interested in going to that country? What's your passion and your connection to wanting to go to that country? How do you think you're qualified to be an ambassador or to teach English and, and go to that country? And what are you going to gain from going there? And what are you going to share when, when you go there? Don't apply for an award and a country because you think you stand a good chance based on the statistics. It's going to come through in the application. Be very sincere um, and committed with with what you're proposing and, and where you're proposing to apply, okay? About the foreign language, even if it's not required or recommended, as an SPA, I always strongly recommend that you consider enrolling in classes um, for the language for the host country. If anything, I, I know that reviewers see that as commitment on your part as an applicant. As Lee mentioned, you're going to have to be an ambassador. How are you supposed to engage with the community if you aren't familiar at a fundamental level of the language in the country? And so if you have any experience with the language, if you don't, um, start polishing those skills, enroll in some classes. I had someone ask me, well, can I just take Duolingo? So that doesn't get reviewed as well as if you enroll in classes for the, for the foreign language. So, um, but show some commitment and interest in learning the, the language for the host country and start trying to identify a faculty who can evaluate you because the application is due in September. And when you come back to school in August, everyone's busy, right? It's going to be kind of hard if you wait until August to find someone who's going to do your evaluation. So you might want to try to 
um, look at the different language departments now and try to reach out to someone now and say, hey, I'm interested in Fulbright. I'm going to be enrolling in some classes. Um, I need to have someone do my evaluation. Do you mind if we communicate over the summer and then closer again when school starts um, so we can prepare for my language evaluation? Same thing with references. Don't wait till last minute and expect that your references will be able to write something for you in two weeks because your references are due. All application materials are due by the campus deadline, September 12th. So talk to your references now. Start reaching out to the people who you think know you best as an applicant, who are gonna be able to really speak to what you're proposing. If you have drafts that you can share with them before they write their recommendation, that would be ideal. So drafts of your application, drafts of your essays, so that they really know what they're speaking towards. Um, so again, all application materials are due by September 12th, the campus deadline. So that transcript, right? Recommendation letters, language evaluations, essays, everything has to be submitted by then. So again, next point, transcripts. All your previous institutions start requesting them now, right? Because you're done, right? You're done at those previous institutions. Get official copies of those now because you're going to have to get ready to scan them. With UH, just remember that it's taking longer with the electronic transcript process. So don't think that you can request it the week of September 12th and that you're gonna get it. You can't go to the registrar's office to pick up a rush transcript. They're not doing that during the pandemic. So you need to plan in advance to request all your electronic transcripts, okay? Um, and then if you're gonna do a research proposal, make sure that this summer you secure your affiliation letter. That's really key. Okay, again, you're not going to have time come August to get your affiliation letter. Start talking to your advisor or department chair or, or grad chair or connections that you have on who you can reach out to and obtain an affiliation letter from. And then if you are putting together an arts portfolio, you might want to start thinking about what is it you want to include in that and start gathering your materials.